It's actually a misconception. You think quantum physics is about the small stuff, the, the atoms and electrons. It's actually not true. Quantum physics is the best theory that we know of today that describes the universe as a whole. Last week, uh, Thursday, the uh, cover story of uh, Nature magazine reported that um, a team at Google, our team, had achieved uh, quantum supremacy. And it was actually a big enough deal for them that they reserved the 150th anniversary edition of uh, Nature magazine to announce those news. So you may wonder, what is quantum supremacy? In essence, is the moment when a quantum processor uh, surpasses a classical supercomputer for the first time. And then a little bit to our delight and uh, also to our surprise, um, this paper became um, the most uh, cited paper of its vintage. And uh, even the New York Times uh, put it on the um, front page and likened it to um, the first flight. So we had a bit of this uh, Sputnik moment. and. Because many scientists believed that a quantum processor, in principle and theory, can be built, but it hadn't, wasn't shown in practice yet that indeed they could do something powerful. So, how do you demonstrate that um, your processor can do something powerful? How do you um, demonstrate a quantum supremacy? So, essentially, um, this is a term of art to uh, denote a computational race. So you take a computational task, a benchmark task, and admittedly we take a task that quantum computers are good at, but then you hand this task to your quantum processor prototype and you give it to the fastest um, classical supercomputer you can find. Uh, currently that is the Summit machine at Oak Ridge National Lab. And then you start your race, you time it, and we found that uh, the quantum processor could solve this task in 200 seconds, but uh, the summit machine would take 10,000 years. And mind you, during these 10,000 years, it eats about the electricity of a city. So, how did we get here? The idea of quantum computing was conceived by Richard Feynman. He is often credited with this. And uh, many people do not know, actually, uh, it was news to me, too. In part of his career, he ran an early version of what we today would call a data center. And he realized that some basic task, like, for example, computing the configuration of a molecule, will, is not feasible with this uh, data center and actually will stay out of reach for classical computers forever. And he coins this uh, term, he said, Nature is not classical, goddammit, and if you want to simulate nature, you better make your simulator quantum mechanical. That's basically the idea of a quantum processor. And then folks followed, like my intellectual hero, uh, David Deutsch, and luminaries such as Peter Shore, they showed theoretically that quantum algorithms could indeed do something powerful. And then fast forward, in 2006, um, I joined Google through the acquisition of my company, and at the time I was responsible for advancing visual search. So face recognition, object recognition, Google Glass, um, adversarial images, so it's like the deep fakes. Um, these are activities that uh, started in my group. And as what we call it, Google a 20% project, I coded up some algorithms for quantum machine learning and quantum computer vision um, and ran it on a D-Wave quantum annealer. Then in 2012, the, um, this became an official project and the Google AI quantum lab was born. And then in 2014, we became what is called a full-stack operation. Essentially, Larry Page uh, gave us permission to bring a group around um, John Martinez from UC Santa Barbara bring them to Google to join our lab to start the fabrication of Google quantum hardware. And I still recall at that time, um, to entice uh, Larry to do this investment, I told him, hey, in the three years we will come back and we put a chip on your table and this chip will be able to do things that are beyond the reach, that is beyond the reach of classical computers. So now I don't know whether Larry is very generous or whether he just forgot but when the three years was over, I didn't get a call, which 
kind of was good because uh, it took us a year and a half longer to make good on this promise, but uh, now we do have it. So, why are people excited about quantum computers? What's the, the tantalizing promise of quantum computers? And it's essentially from the perspective of theoretical computer science, an abacus and a classical computer, the digital computer, is not all that different. If you have a task like multiplying two numbers, they do it both with the same number of steps. Granted, the digital computer is much quicker per step than an abacus. But a quantum processor is in a different league in the sense that it can do certain tasks with fewer steps, and sometimes with exponentially fewer steps. And vice versa, as Feynman had already noticed, there are certain tasks, we always think computers are so powerful, actually it is the case that there are many tasks that are out of reach and will stay out of reach, um, what computers can do. So quantum computers represent a new computational medium. And let me illustrate this uh, for you with um, the most basic task that Google is concerned with, that is search. And the simplest search is what we call unstructured search. So think of putting one item into a database. You want to visualize this a database, is a million drawers, and then we put an object inside there, and your task is to find the object out of the million drawers. So how many steps would this take you? Now, there's no trick question here. On average, you will have to open half the drawers, so half a million drawers you will have to open. But as amazing as this may sound, is if this would be a quantum memory, a quantum database, then you could find the item with certainty with just a thousand operations. Well, that's kind of puzzling, you know, how can that possibly be? And I want to give you a little bit of flavor of why can a quantum processor do this. And the story here is that maybe you know that much about classical physics. You know, typical thing a physicist would do, you throw a ball, and if you know the beginning position and you know the velocity, then a physicist can tell you what is the probability that the ball will land over there in a certain area. But this is classical physics. So if in quantum physics, if I would do the same, but metaphorically I take an electron and throw it, then it's not enough to just look at one trajectory. You essentially have to look at every possible path the electron can take, and then you have to add up all these passes to get to the probability that it will land over there or at a different location. So you have to consider all its trajectories. And similarly, if in computational physics we often uh, describe a system by bits, you know, think of three coins I throw on the table, so it's um, heads, tails, heads, then again, this is our everyday thinking would say there's one configuration, but quantum physics would say, hey, if you want to make a real precise prediction how the system will evolve in the future, you have to consider the other configurations as well, for example, heads, 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 tails, tails, tails. In this case, it would be like eight different configurations. And you see there's this exponential resource hidden. Why is it eight? Because each bit has two states, and it's to the power of three. So if you have three coins, you can make eight configurations. If you had a fourth coin, it would already be 16 configurations. So this is the basic lesson of quantum mechanics. It's not good enough to only look at the configuration that you perceive in a moment. You have to think about the other configurations as well, because they will influence how things evolve in the future. And this leads to a rather surprising conclusion. Often, it's actually a misconception. You think quantum physics is about the small stuff, say the atoms and electrons. It's actually not true. Quantum physics is the best theory that we know of today that describes the universe as a whole. And it actually describes us sitting here in the room as well, and we are actually also just one configuration. So you could, for example, change your seat with your neighbor, this would make another configuration, or you guys could go a back row, and there would be yet another configuration. So quantum physics would say all these configurations do exist, 
they have ontological status and they need to be considered. And that's essentially the notion of the multiverse. What we see here is just one sliver of the multiverse, one classical universe, but there are many others that make up the totality, the multiverse. And maybe my German upbringing caused me to have a penchant for philosophy. This, if you make peace with this idea, which is the most straightforward interpretation of the equations of quantum mechanics, you would you get to interesting questions, like, why do I perceive this world, not the others? Did I have any choice in it? Yeah? Or what happens if you die in one of the other worlds, but you're still alive here? So to make good, brings us back down to engineering. Um, our team in Santa Barbara that manufactures the chips, they do these beautiful artifacts. Here you see the, um, the Sycamore chip. This has 54 qubits and was used for the supremacy experiment. It represents qubits as the superconducting oscillators, and they need to be kept like really cold. So we use these um, devices that you see here called dilution refrigerator. Now, they are not exactly like your fridge that you have in the kitchen, because they cool down the chip to 10 millikelvin. So this is about 100 times colder than interstellar space. So you can think of um, this, the spot where the chip sits, as a, or I like to think of it as a zen-like place. It's exquisitely dark, exquisitely quiet, and that's where the quantum information can unfold. And with these devices, there's now a new era in computer science opened in the sense that there are certain computations where the only place in the world, if you happen to be interested in these computations, is the Google Data Center in Santa Barbara. And to give you a sense what we can do with um, these devices, um, let me just touch on um, two areas. One is referred to as quantum simulation. Or we often say this is Feynman's killer application. Um, and it essentially deals with the simulation of quantum systems. And that is often required, for example, in computational material science, computational chemistry, computational pharmacology. This is a valuable tool. So if you want to make lightweight batteries and you want to understand new electrolyte materials, today, actually, it's a very clunky process. The engineer, if he has an idea for a new electrolyte, he would have to build the battery, take it in the lab, measure it, and see what the result is. This is very slow. With a quantum processor, we could try millions of battery materials of electrolytes and only take the 100 best to the lab. And similar story you heard from John Doerr, how important it would be to have low-loss um, power transmission or um, the, the beautiful molecules we saw yesterday from Francis. They cannot be simulated today, but with a quantum processor, we would be able to. And we have a little bit of hope that this may trigger a modern-day industrial revolution. So another area, Google is an AI-first company, and we are called the Google AI Quantum Lab. I'm not sure how many people here work in AI, but there are many opportunities to use quantum resources in AI. Um, I might just give you one example, which is the little example I gave you earlier with the, the uh, drawer, um, find one item in a database. It's actually a special case of what we call an optimization problem. Now, these problems deal with finding the lowest um, price ticket across a number of cities or the shortest route. And it turns out that machine learning, let's say the, the training of a big neural network, for example, is typically formulated, or not typically, it's always formulated as an optimization problem. And we know that quantum algorithms would solve optimization problems faster than classical machines can. So I would expect that in about 10 years from now, quantum processors will turn out to be an indispensable coprocessor for AI systems. In general, this word coprocessor, which means you have a processor that is good in certain specialized tasks, but not necessarily good in other things, is the right way to think about a quantum processor. And will accelerate certain important tasks. 
And to conclude, I want to give you a little bit a look ahead because I don't want you to go home with this, a feeling, oh, it's, it's done now, um, quantum computers have appeared. It's still very early days. We only have 50-ish qubits, and, that's, and moreover, we don't have what is called error correction yet. So we uh, can only apply a rather limited number of operations to our qubits before we have to stop, otherwise the chance of not getting the right result at the end is too high. And it will probably take us another 10 years to make chips with more and more qubits and run more and more interesting algorithms. Now, the era I earlier bragged that now a new era in computer science has started. This era actually has a name. It's called the NISC era. It stands for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. And eventually this will be superseded by an area when we have fault-tolerant or error-corrected quantum computers. But maybe I give you sort of one final piece to, to think about is, um, for example, if you would say, oh, let's say when I meet our CFO, Ruth Porat, she may ask the question, hey, do we really have to invest? It's expensive building uh, quantum processes. Can we not just emulate those with our classical machines and just be smarter about how we do this? And the answer is no, because the power you need, or the computational effort you need to simulate a quantum processor grows actually at a double exponential rate. Yeah, so the hardest thing to make better in a quantum processor is the, the error rates of the operations. And if you make the assumptions that every few years we halve the error, you know, that's sort of our direct analog to Moore's law. But then it doesn't stop there. If you have lower error, we can now do more operations. In our community, we call this the computational volume that we have available grows. And if you want to simulate computational volume, it turns out that the simulation cost is also exponential in the volume itself. So this gives you a second exponential. Overall, you get a double exponential growth. And that's just mind-numbing fast. And actually, after we formulated this law of double exponential growth, people pointed out that there's no known process in nature we are aware of where double exponential growth curve um, occurs. And actually, as just in the last days uh, preparing those slides, it occurred to me is this may be another piece of evidence that we have indeed unlocked sort of additional dimensions that we haven't used before. Because David Deutsch, who I'm going to mention in the beginning, he would tell you, or he predicted that if people see, hey, there's this small thumbnail-sized processor, and it does a task where otherwise you need this behemoth of a machine churning away for thousands of years, where is this computation happening? And what David Deutsch's answer would have been is the computation doesn't happen, or a quantum computation doesn't happen in our world alone. It essentially farms the computation out in the parallel universes, and there the computations occur as well. Okay. <laughs> <I see. laughs> Thank <laughs> you.